So before I get into this, I know that the um, recent developments with uh, Saudi Arabia uh, this week and last um, have put the relationship or the, um, the approach of the Saudi government uh, to dissidents uh, in, some, in the public notice. So, uh, Joe, you mentioned that uh, Canada um, took a strong position in support of human rights. So maybe I can give you a little bit of background, um, hopefully that's helpful to understand why Canada is taking this position. Um, co governments, they come and governments go, right? They come and go. But this government, the government of Prime Minister Trudeau, is... Um, can I help with... No? Sure. The government of Prime Minister Trudeau, and this is something that you would not read elsewhere, they are very serious about Canadian values. For them, it's... It's a matter on which, it's a hill on which they're willing to suffer. To die, I don't know, but to suffer. Uh, meaning that when, you know, governments sometimes are good at um, paying lip service to principles, but when it starts hurting, sometimes you compromise. You know, you can see that uh, in our history, maybe, or around the world. Uh, but this government, really believes in standing up for what they call Canadian values, which we would argue are universal values. And this government believes it so much that their instructions to people like me, and in fact, people around the world, ambassadors and other diplomats, is do what it takes to stand up for those values. And they start at the very top with the Prime Minister himself and our Minister of Foreign Affairs and all government ministers. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a cynical thing. It's, not, it's really top government policy. We have these values of respect for human rights, democracy, uh, free press, and uh, the rule of law and independent courts and whatever. Um, in fact, principles that we know you share in America, we have always, um, more often than not, um, had an agreement on these things. And they will support those and stand up for those principles, even if it hurts. So when the Saudi uh, government uh, harassed these two ladies who, um, who, uh, whose family name is, one of them is ba Badawi, I believe. Uh, in fact, I have the tweet with me because I knew this would come up. But uh, uh, the, the Saudi government harassed these ladies who are human rights advocates. Our Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, put out a statement and it says, nothing too egregious, you might agree, Canada is gravely concerned about the additional arrests of civil society and women's rights activists in Saudi Arabia, including Samar Badawi. We urge the Saudi authorities to immediately release them and all other peaceful human rights activists. So not a declaration of war, really. More of a statement of principles and um, a call to respect universal principles. Um, speaking up your mind shouldn't get you imprisoned, uh, but in some countries it does. The, the backlash by the Saudi government was fierce and immediate. Within 24 hours, they expelled our ambassador, they suspended trade, um, they uh, brought back students uh, who were in medical school in Canada. Um, they, um, uh, you know, and I, there's many more measures that they were taking to send a strong signal that what they call um, interference in the internal affairs of Saudi Arabia will not be tolerated. Um, so anyway, th that, the way that played out in Canada is interesting because the government was criticized within Canada for taking a strong stand. What, how can we do this when we have large military contracts at stake here and multi-billion dollar uh, agreements and 
and uh, shouldn't we have known better than to criticize this way and so on and so forth. And the government stood firm. We, we know it may hurt business, but if we don't stand up, if, if Canada doesn't stand up for human rights, who will? And frankly, we were hoping, and this is me being frank a little bit here, we were hoping that our friends here might agree with uh, and come to publicly uh, support Canada's position. I don't think we got that too much. Uh, but neither did we get it, neither did we get a strong endorsement of our position from Europe. So Canada was left quite a bit uh, out in the open on this one. Um, you know, it's a complex situation. Could we have handled it differently? Maybe. Um, certainly we are engaging with the Saudi authorities privately as well, not just publicly. Uh, so this was nothing they hadn't heard before. Um, you know, again, we, we could talk all night about this situation, but I, I would just say that the, the more recent events of the Khashoggi, um, Jamal Khashoggi and the situation that, frankly, I'm not aware of all the latest details, but it looks to have been a very dramatic situation in Turkey. Um, and uh, again, I don't want to speak because I don't know the facts, but there are situations like that that arise. And if we surrender our principles, and anyway, that's, that would be a Canadian position. If we surrender our principles and our basic human values, human rights in particular, in the name of more money, more contracts, um, our principles are not that principled, are they? So I would just leave it at that, and hopefully that's enough, helpful. Um, but again, in the conversation, I'm happy to, unless you have a burning question on this, but I'm not directly involved, but uh, um, I think what I wanted to convey is the government's commitment to standing up for those principles of human rights. Okay, so how about we get into this presentation? I have a mouse here. I'll try to go somewhat quickly. I warn you in advance, there's a lot of information. You will not be able to read all the information. Uh, the presentation is available. It can be available to anyone, I believe, through the World Affairs Council, if that's okay. Uh, it's public information. You're welcome to have a copy uh, electronically. And, um, but I'll, I'll try to hit some of the highlights and again leave room for, for discussion. The, the, main the main message is this. Our peoples have always been, and our nations have always been, the best friends, partners, allies. We've had difficulties before. We will have difficulties again. In the current context, our difficulties are not with, between the Canadian people and the American people. Our difficulties are with this administration in Washington on those issues, largely trade. We just don't see trade the same way. We don't understand <laughs> economics the same way. And uh, we don't look at history the same way. Um, so, but I, I want to be very clear. Our peoples, our forebears, our ancestors built this continent together. We defend it together in NORAD, close by here, right? We um, have common culture, language, values. We are in this together. We're joined at the hip. And nothing will ever change that. So I want to put that in context. I may talk about some disagreements, but it's really with that government of the time, of the moment, on those issues. Um, so I'll go, I'll, I'll start with, there will be a fairly heavy trade aspect to this. I understand NAFTA or the successor agreement uh, is of interest, but we'll talk about trade um, from a Canada the whole of the USA perspective will dr drill down a bit more in Colorado, but I don't want to talk just about trade. I want to talk to you about other aspects of our relationship and then um, uh, talk about what the things that we've done that go well, some of the things that remain to be fixed because there are a few, and, um, and then look forward to what's, what happens next. So 
we're the big country to the north. We're, <laughs> we, we export our hockey teams. Uh, the, the Quebec City Nordiques became the avalanche, as you know. And you're welcome for the two Stanley Cups. Uh, <laughs> a, a point of sore, sore, uh, a sore point for me. Uh, uh, but I'm a Montreal guy anyway. So, but um, seriously, we um, we share the same the same border. Our border is the longest undefended, unmilitarized border anywhere in history. Five thousand miles. Um, we again, um, have such a shared history that uh, we're going to look at all the, all the dimensions of that. We are, so starting with the trade aspect of our relationship, we are um, enormous trading partners. I will get into some de uh, data in a minute, but um, energy is a part of that. We have the third largest um, crude oil reserves in the world. Um, and that's just one aspect of the trade that we do. Um, and we, we trade in everything. Um, aerospace, you see the, the plane there, uh, automaking, of course. The point I want to make, and I'll exemplify that a little bit more, the point is our economies are deeply integrated, in particular under NAFTA. Before we were trading always, you know, before NAFTA, before the Canada-US free trade agreement, we were always trading our nations, our peoples. But um, under NAFTA, we have done two things. We've tripled the amount of trade between our nations. So we sell more to each other, triple, in fact, according to the baseline of before NAFTA. But we also make things differently. We make things together. Our supply chains are integrated in all sorts of um, areas, and we'll examine some of that later. In terms of our trade, the, the numbers are on the next slide, so I'll go quickly to that, um, I think, or maybe not. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that. Trade between Canada and the US last year was 600, I believe, 600 and 674 billion, okay. So, 674 billion. You know, you hear a lot in the Washington circles about how America is getting fleeced by all of its trading partners. So, woe to America because it's so bad. I'm being facetious. But your economy is incredible. You're doing great. In terms of our trading relationship, um, Washington, you will hear about the, the deficit that America may have with other countries, Mexico, with, uh, with China, maybe, or other countries. I would like to tell you that in terms of Canada, trade is balanced between Canada and, and the US. In fact, America has a slight surplus over Canada in respect to trade of all goods and services combined. We can unpack those numbers, and there are some areas where America has a surplus, America, uh, Canada may have a surplus in certain things like energy, uh, energy trade, uh, crude oil, and hydroelectricity. But if you account for all goods and services, America has a surplus. Now, so that means we have a deficit. We don't mind particularly because we don't think deficits are a true indicator of the health of a trading relationship. But the point for tonight would be that the trade is balanced. So America and Canada are great trading partners. It's fair trade and it supports prosperity and jobs in all of our countries. I will speak in a little bit later on how trade with Canada supports American and Colorado prosperity. But we are the most integrated economies of any two nations on earth. Trying this, uh, 674 billion last year. That's 1.3 million a minute. It keeps growing, even with the uncertainty on NAFTA. It grew year on year from 2016, um, and we are your number one export market. So Canada, 
and very few people know this, in my experience, Canada is your number one export destination. If I had asked people in this room, who is your number one market, maybe some folks would have said China, because you hear a lot about China, uh, Europe maybe, Japan. So just to put it in perspective, Canada buys more American goods and services than all of China, all of Japan, and all of the UK combined. And these are American numbers. I'm not fudging the numbers. <laughs> these are American numbers. So another point of comparison is we buy more from America than all of the European Union countries combined. So it, it does support the point that our prosperity does depend on access to your market. There's no question. We export about 75% um, of our GDP. We must export. We are a trading nation. 80% of that 75% goes to America. We depend on access to your market. But I would say that your prosperity depends on access to our market too, because we buy more from, than all these other countries combined. So we are in this together. We make things together. And um, um, we, you know, when you have a relationship this big and wide, issues pop up, but we, you need to work those out, because we always have. Then you move on and you create more prosperity. So this is where it becomes real in terms of jobs. Uh, we looked at the volume of trade. Trade and investment with Canada in 2017 supported 9 million jobs across the U.S. That's Canadian businesses set up in the U.S. and uh, directly employing Americans. So there's probably around 500,000 Americans directly employed by Canadian firms set up in Colorado and across the U.S. The other eight and a half million are people, uh, Americans working for American firms that trade with Canada because access to our market creates jobs in, in America, of course. You need people to make those products and make those services. Um, so uh, across the U.S., everywhere in Colorado and elsewhere, trade with Canada and investment supports American jobs. Um, and I will look at the numbers for Colorado. It's actually 141,000 given, you know, more or less, 141,000 jobs in Colorado depend on trade and investment with Canada. So, and that's spread out across the state, uh, not just the front range. So I know you can't make sense of all the numbers. You can't see them. You'll have access to the, the presentation. But the point is, you import more in Colorado than, than we import from you. But the reason is energy. We are a big provider of energy to America and crude oil to Colorado. It will come here. It will be processed in Colorado or elsewhere. And uh, it will make its way to the refineries and become fuel and other uh, petroleum products. Uh, so that's a big reason why we Im you import a lot more. If you take out oil, because you still need oil, for all the miracle of your shale revolution and your energy revolution, you still need to import energy because your economy is that mighty that for all the production in America, you still need to import uh, oil uh, from other sources. Canada is your number one foreign source of energy. Crude oil, of course, we'll get into energy in a second, but also hydroelectricity, of course, in the Northeast and so on. So you see some of the sectors where Colorado and Canada trade. You see mining and metals, you see machinery, you see chemicals, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and of course, agriculture, uh, cattle in particular and others. Alberta cattle will come down, live animals will come down to Colorado. They'll be processed here. And often we will buy back those meat products at a big premium because, because somehow that makes sense. I'm not sure. But then, um, so this is, this is uh, after dinner. I'm, I'm sure you're not so tempted by this. But if I present this at lunch, usually people, um, the point of this is, I said earlier, under NAFTA, we sell more to each other, but we make things together. This is in an example of that, where we have a great product 
that integrates all the inputs from different places. You could switch the sources uh, of these, you know, the, the, the components, the component parts of the burger. You could switch them around. I think here the the flowers from Saskatchewan. It could be from Kansas. Uh, the um, the beef is from uh, Alberta. The cattle is from Alberta. It's processed here in Colorado. The condiments probably come from Mexico or someplace. Um, the point is, in that North American economic zone, the components come together in a very efficient way. Not because government created these supply chains that give us great products at an affordable price. Governments didn't do that. It's businesses. It's our businesses working together uh, and creating the best products, the best services at an affordable price. And when we create a burger like that, or anything, like a car or whatever, when we do that, we create great products we can sell within North America, but more, perhaps more importantly, we can outcompete the rest of the world. Our businesses are hugely competitive around the world. We have, uh, I think this is later on in the slides, we have about 24% of, 7% uh, of the global population in the three NAFTA countries, Canada, Mexico, US, 7% of global population, 24% of global GDP. So think about that. Of course, America is the centerpiece of that, the engine for that. But America needs raw materials. It needs energy. It needs expertise, innovation also. That comes, and Mexico brings, you know, um, affordable labor and other uh, raw materials. All that feeds into the mighty American economy that then, that then will produce stuff that will be sold around the world. Um, so we need you, but you need us too. And together, we outcompete the rest of the world. And the subtext to what I'm saying is anything that makes that integrated economic engine hum is good for our prosperity, our shared prosperity. Anything that erects barriers, uh, raises costs on businesses to seamlessly work together to make stuff, anything like that makes us less competitive in North America, but around the world. And so there's a lot at stake in the in uh, the, the subject matter for tonight. I know you can't make sense of this slide, but that's the point. There is so much going on, <laughs> how self-serving, eh? but the point is, in energy, we are, again, joined at the hip. Our, our energy infrastructure is completely integrated, not only in transmission lines for hydroelectricity in sort of the, the northeastern part of the country, but if you look at the, the pipeline infrastructure, those blue-green lines um, in respect to natural gas or to crude oil, very much integrated in such a way that we, we are, in a way, Canada is a reservoir of energy that feeds into your, your manufacturing powerhouse and your economy and helps power uh, Trump Tower in New York uh, with hydroelectricity, clean energy. But also, um, crude oil goes to all refineries in, in, um, in across America. So that's just one other representation of how we are integrated. Environmental coll collaboration, uh, of course, we share the continent, so we share the common environment. That pretty much goes without saying. Um, I, I would say we don't have a perfect alignment of environmental policies right now. Um, so in, uh, we did before, but we don't anymore. But that's OK. Um, this, these are some of the issues where our governments continue to engage. We in Canada believe strongly that climate change is real because it's obvious, but also because we believe that human activity is a significant contributor. You know, I'm a lawyer. I'm not qualified to, 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 to uh, contest the scientific consensus of 99% of the world's scientists who are qualified to make this arrangement. So we believe in science. We make those policies based on science. We are committed to our Paris Agreement targets. Uh, I wouldn't say it's easy to move in that direction. There are trade-offs everywhere, but we are committed. We are putting a price on carbon. That includes a carbon tax or other ways of putting a price on carbon, which 
in California, for example, the cap and trade system, uh, where you essentially, um, uh, companies will have quotas of pollution they can do and they can trade credits and purchase them. So regardless of how it's going to be done in Canada, the government is putting in place a framework. It started this year where gradually we will have a price on carbon that reaches $50 uh, a megaton of emissions uh, in the year 20, 2022, I believe. That's a measure, not the only one, regulatory, public education, many other ways. But we are convinced that we must put a price on carbon and gradually reduce our emissions because we have to do our part. We help create this mess. Canada is 2% of world emissions, so we're not like, we're not owning this by ourselves, but we have to do our part. And uh, we certainly are engaging at the federal level with minimal success. But we are engaging at the subnational level, at the state level, the municipal level in America, looking for partners that can work with us so that we can advance uh, policies that will help protect our planet and help us deal with those changes of, com of climate change, which are happening all around us. There's no, there's no uh, two ways about it. So um, you see some other aspects of what we do on the environment. This is where I want to spend a quick moment. Um, NORAD, uh, of course you all know about NORAD, um, but I don't know if you know that to the extent to which Canada and the US are integrated partners in this command for the protection of uh, North America. So the Canadian, the um, commander of NORAD has always been an American general, a four-star general currently uh, General O'Shaughnessy. But the deputy commander has always been a Canadian general. You walk, many of you, which, how many of you have gone to NORAD at Peterson or inside the mountain? Some of you. Uh, and perhaps you had a chance to see uh, the way that the crews are set up. But when you walk into the Peterson Air Force Base, the command center, there's not a Canadian team and an American team. They're blended teams. The team leader, or the, the colonel, or whatever the rank may be, may be Canadian or American. The teams are blended with Americans and Canadians. And uh, so it's really a unique model where we, an in a very integrated way, we defend our joint airspace and our, jo and our common homeland in a way. And I would tell you, the man here, General Findlay, on 9-11, that very fateful day, none of us will ever forget, on 9-11, the Canadian deputy <coughs> commander and the American commander were not at their, they're not um, able to be in the command center. It was General Findlay, the chief of, um, chief of operations, a Canadian general who took control of American airspace and directed flights to safety. Think about that. The Twin Towers are hit, Pentagon is hit, a Canadian general on duty takes control of American airspace, directs flight to safety, including Gander, Newfoundland, where you might know the story, that Broadway musical, which by the way is coming to Denver. Get your tickets, it's cool. Um, <laughs> So the, the, the town of Gander, Newfoundland, is about 4,000 people on a good day. The population, uh, you might know the story, the population doubled overnight. Because of 9-11, all these flights are landing. And the population locally, there were not enough hotels, motels, whatever. So people welcomed Americans into their homes with food and blankets and whatever, so that our cousins from America could be safe and could feel welcome. Um, and I'll tell you just a small parenthesis. This uh, is very personal to, uh, to me and uh, people who experience this on the Canadian side because when 9-11 when, um, happened, I remember how I felt. I remember how people in my office felt. We felt hurt and angry because you were hurt and angry. So it wasn't like, oh, these people over there got hurt and how bad is that? It was that. But our cousins got hurt 
it's not this, it wasn't across the world. You guys and us, we are family. In fact, I know that many of you have family in Canada or came from Canada or have friends or studied in Canada or whatever, brother-in-law somewhere or, um, you know, and it's true, it's true uh, of Canadians as well. We are family and we felt like that. And you know it's real when it feels like that because on that day, everything was exposed to the naked truth. And that truth was how, how inseparable we are as people because we build this place together. Um, so I thought I would share that because very few people know about General Findlay and his role on that day. Security and defense, of course, goes well beyond NORAD. We are founding members of NATO. We started NATO way back when with other countries in Europe, of course, and we still defend our shared values and our security uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Canada right now is leading a battalion, in, a multinational battalion uh, in Latvia. We are, in, we are with you in uh, Iraq and uh, we, are, uh, we have been in Afghanistan since uh, the invasion of Afghanistan right after 9-11. Uh, we have fought with you in all major conflicts, uh, including a f a conflicts like uh, Vietnam, for which Canada was not a part officially of the Vietnam War, but over 70,000, 70,000 Canadians went and enlisted to fight in Vietnam <laughs> alongside our American brothers and, and sisters. So we have a shared history of defending our values and our common security in all major um, uh, areas of conflict. Um, I thought I would say a word because it's kind of timely. Um, plus it's Colorado, come on. But uh, I think I'll move this way a little bit, although that mic might be tricky. Um, cannabis, so can Canada is legalizing marijuana tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I really am impressed with um, the World Affairs Council for making my, my pre presentation possible on the eve of legalization. <laughs> it's really impressive. Uh, I don't know how you pulled that off. But uh, tomorrow, Canada is legalizing cannabis for recreational purposes across the country. The reason we can do that, first of all, the government of Prime Minister Trudeau ran on that platform. So he has a mandate from the people. But also, the criminal um, jurisdiction and under our constitution is federal. So the government can add a stroke of a, a, a bill of law that pa is passed and signed by the governor general, can decriminalize, and we are doing it tomorrow. Now, that doesn't mean that it's a free-for-all in Canada, and it would be malpractice if I gave you that impression. In Canada, there will be, starting tomorrow, a very strict regulatory framework very similar to the approach uh, that we have taken and you take on access um, to alcohol and tobacco. The, the intent is obviously to keep marijuana outside of the hands of kids. Uh, many people came from Canada to study the Colorado experience in having a, 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 you know, a solid regulatory framework. Um, and many of the things were modeled on your experience in Oregon and Washington State and others. So we're trying to leverage best practices. Uh, the point is to keep this stuff out of the hands of minors. Uh, it's going to be an, an overlay of federal regulations and provincial. Um, the, age, the minimum age of possession and consumption will be 18 uh, federally across the nation, but uh, provinces can increase that and increase the restrictions. So in Quebec, it will be 21, Ontario 19, whatever. It will vary across the nation. Uh, but the point is to continue, um, you know, educating folks, keeping this stuff out of the hands of kids, uh, regulating point of sale, advertising, and so on. Uh, but also a key point is it will remain, as it is today, tomorrow, it will remain illegal to import cannabis into Canada or to export it out of Canada. So any cannabis consumed in Canada will be produced in Canada and cannot be exported. And so I mentioned that because there could be concerns in the US 
where it's legal in Colorado, but not everywhere across the U.S. There could be concerns about the border becoming, or Canada becoming a source of unrestricted access to uh, supply of marijuana to the U.S. Uh, our, our border services are working with yours. Our, our uh, federal police is working with the FBI and uh, other authorities to make sure that the border remains closed to trade in actual cannabis or related products. It doesn't mean that it's not possible to do some business in Canada. A lot of Colorado companies are interested in investing in Canada, for example. Those things are possible and they're happening. Uh, but in terms of the, uh, the risk of diversion of product into the, the U.S. market, uh, we're doing everything we can, working with your government to prevent that. So the U.S.-Mexico-Canada um, agreement, I'm not crazy about that name, uh, because if you think about it, it doesn't say what the agreement is about. It says who's a party to it, sure. But is it an agreement about trade or defense or what? Uh, library uh, cards? Uh, I don't know. So anyway, point being, we have a new deal, and that is a big deal. Why? Because the agreement may not be perfect, and sure is not in our perspective, but it's a good agreement, and it removes some of that massive uncertainty that the renegotiation of NAFTA was creating because of all that drama around are we going to have an agreement or not, uh, I would tell you that the negotiations were um, intense. Uh, they might have been a little dramatic at times, uh, but at the end of the day, we have an agreement that we can call a win-win-win. A win for Canada, Mexico, and in our view, and American government is happy, it seems, with the outcome. And so we have this agreement that uh, modifies NAFTA uh, to make it more modern uh, by, for example, including a new chapter on digital trade, which of course did not exist 25 years ago when NAFTA was first negotiated. So the economy has changed. Uh, there's a new chapter on the environment, uh, uh, energy, new provisions, uh, labor rights. So there are many things that have been brought up to date in this agreement. Uh, but the point is, neither, none of the three countries got all that they wanted. We certainly did not, and I could tell you things that we would have liked, but um, you know, you never do that. You never get all that you want in a negotiation. But can we walk away with something that we say is, a, uh, is progress? The answer is yes. Um, so uh, there's data there about um, a few things that I've already mentioned, I will not uh, deal with that too much. I would just tell you that the current, the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, first of all, it's not a done deal. It must be ratified by the legislature in all three countries. We don't expect a big problem in Canada. Uh, Mexico, I'm guessing it's going to go in the right direction. I think for us, we're watching what's going to happen in America because you're having your midterms. It seems that this new agreement cannot be considered by Congress uh, before the new Congress comes in after the midterm, so in January and so on. And we'll see soon what the makeup of the new Congress is, right? Um, so wait and see, but um, hopefully that becomes reality in, in Congress, is approved, so that we can move on with doing what we do best again, work in a very integrated way to create prosperity for our communities and our workers and our families. Um, and this slide is a summary of what we get when we have a good, solid free trade agreement. What we have is a continued tariff-free trade in goods and services. We have more choice and more affordable products for consumers. We talk a lot about manufacturers, you know, in trade. Let's not forget all of us here are consumers. We all go to Cherry Creek or Target or Walmart or whatever, and the prices we get and the products we have access to are determined by what's available on the market, and free trade brings us more products at a more affordable price. Um, and uh, continued um, integration in energy so that we can, have, we can achieve North American energy independence, 
and uh, so on and so forth. So a lot of good, uh, good benefits. Um, but I would tell you that for all the benefits of this new trade agreement, the job's not done. This current government in Washington believes in uh, protectionist measures, we can say that. Uh, and one of those measures is putting tariffs on everyone and everything. I'm just saying. Um, and you, you probably know this, but for all the talk about China and other countries that don't trade fairly with America, we, Canada, have been on the receiving end of a lot of tariffs. Lumber, uh, softwood lumber is a perennial example and it's still applicable. Um, uh, steel and aluminum are some of the more recent ones, and there are others. But I'll mention steel and aluminum because the, pre the pretext, the justification by Washington for putting tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum was national security. In other words, when our companies supply aluminum and steel to America, American customers, for your infrastructure uh, development, for your housing, for whatever, we are creating a risk, a national security risk to America. I will tell you that didn't go too well, go, go over too well in Canada. I talked to you about NATO and NORAD and all these other ways in which we have been, uh, you know, our soldiers have fought and died together. In fact, in Afghanistan, I will tell you, Canada has um, in absolute numbers less uh, casualties in America, but in relative numbers to the size of our population, we have, in fact, a higher ratio of casualties, uh, deceased, and, and so on. So we, we don't like to be considered a uh, national security risk, and yet here we are. We thought that these tariffs would be a negotiating tactic to force Canada into signing some agreement on, uh, on NAFTA or the new, the new trade agreement. Okay, so now we have a trade agreement. Let's remove those tariffs. Uh, apparently, it's more complicated than that. So um, I'll just share with you that we consider this absolutely essential. We are confident that because of the engagement we have with Washington, that those tariffs will be removed, that those tariffs are hurting our communities and yours. Because we all know about the, the rising costs of uh, housing in Colorado and, and elsewhere. With all that, those natural disasters and that reconstruction that you have to do across the US, we have lumber tariffs that increase about 25% the price of a new home. The average price of a new home has increased by $9,000, uh, according to the American um, Association of Home, Builder, Build, Home Builders. And the primary factor is those tariffs on Canadian lumber. And if you add the increased cost of aluminum and, um, and steel for residential or for um, uh, commercial projects or industrial projects, essentially it costs more to build anything in America. So you, your tax dollars are not going as far and you as consumers pay more. Maybe not you, but maybe your kids or your family members. So we need to do away with that. And frankly, we don't understand what we're getting for all that those tariffs that, in, that are essentially taxes on Americans. We're not sure always that people in Washington understand that if, if there's an American tariff on an, a Canadian import, it's not Canada paying that, it's Americans. It's the importer from America paying that tariff and he passes it on to his consumers, his customers, or he, it eats into his margin. So uh, some economic common sense would prevail, hopefully, and we can do away with these tariffs. And this is the end, I'm sure you're very grateful, the very end where we have some uh, visionary statements by um, Presidents Kennedy and Reagan testifying to the uh, historically profound relationship between our populations and our countries, where in fact we are much more than friends, we are partners and we are family. So I'll leave you with that. Hopefully there was some interest for you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hopefully we have time for, for that.
I was wondering what was going on between Boeing and the C-Series jets. Great question. Uh, the issue is resolved, but maybe not forever, and I'll tell you, maybe for the audience. Um, Boeing, of course, very successful, very large company, uh, didn't like too much that uh, little Canadian aerospace company Bombardier, you might have heard of Bombardier, they make planes, trains, and all sorts of things, recreational products. So Bombardier has had a business of regional jets and corporate jets for a long time. And they came out with a C-series, C-series uh, of these uh, regional jets to serve the sort of commuter kind of hub, hub and spoke uh, market in uh, Canada and the US and Europe and elsewhere. So Bombardier is trying to compete in that, uh, in that uh, class of product. Uh, um, about 115 to 130 seats, I believe. Um, Bombard uh, so Bombardier is putting in place its infrastructure to build those airplanes, including in, in America, and sell them to airlines. And they had a first deal with Delta. Um, and Delta agreed to buy some of these things, and Bombardier is looking to market them to other airlines. Boeing decided they didn't like that and petitioned the U.S. government to uh, essentially put a massive duty or tax, essentially, against to increase the cost to Americans of these Bombardier jets. Uh, Canada didn't like that much. Uh, it was, frankly, illegal and illegitimate. We challenged it, and uh, the International Trade Commission, which is a part of the Commerce Department in your country, found that they were, in fact, illegitimate. So uh, those duties were removed, and Bombardier can continue to make uh, these aircraft. Now, because of the pressure from Boeing, uh, that, that pushed Bombardier into the hands of Airbus. So Airbus actually bought a majority stake in the C-Series um, um, aircraft uh, program. And Airbus now, because of all its infrastructure in Alabama and elsewhere, um, that, that program will continue with a strong European component. But we, we couldn't understand why Boeing, that doesn't even make aircraft in that class, would, would argue that their, their market is being uh, uh, flooded by uh, competition from elsewhere. And they pretended that we were subsidizing and Ill illegally and so on. None of that was found to be true but a very um, anti-competitive approach. In our view, Boeing was gaining the system to prevent a competitor from coming in. And I'll just make a point here. I'm a big fan of America and Americans. I grew up part of my youth in Florida, and uh, I always grew up with the notion that American industry could do anything. And now we have companies like Boeing and others uh, petitioning the U.S. government for protection left and right. I thought your companies were the best in the world. Why, why do we need the, Why does the U.S. government, meaning taxpayers, need to protect American companies against fair competition? If it's unfair, I get it. But fair competition, good product at a good price, isn't that what our market-based economy should should encourage? Anyway, I'm editorializing, but thank you for the question. And I didn't plan the question. Next question back here. Thank you for your excellent presentation. This is a question concerning climate change. And because there is such impact of the ice melt in, and fires now throughout Canada, I am interested in your perspectives about a just response across the continent to these hazards? Uh, you mean from a short-term perspective um, in dealing with forest fires and other, uh, you know, um, um, hurricanes that are worse and more frequent? Or do you mean for longer term? Yeah, she said long term for those long who come here. So I'll try to make it, it's extraordinarily complex. I'll tell you what the Canadian approach is in general terms. We believe that 
because of all the resources we have, including enormous crude oil resources in the um, oil sands in Alberta and some in Saskatchewan and whatever, we believe, and the Prime Minister said it this way, no country with these kinds of reserves of crude oil would leave them in the ground and not look to exploit them. So we're trying to walk a fine line between exploiting our enormous oil resources and protecting the environment. Easier said than done, but the, the gamble that the government or the policy of the government is that we are, as a country, Canada, we are engaged in a gradual decarbonization of our economy. It will play out over decades. Um, we still need fossil fuels for the way of life that we have. There's no question. Uh, not just for fuel, but plastics and whatever. So we need to exploit our resources, but we have to do it in the short term, in the most in the cleanest way possible, so that if we are to exploit our resources, we have to do it in the cleanest way where we damage the environment ever less through clean technologies that will reduce emissions and so on and so forth. So we, in other words, in the, in the short term, we try to use less carbon, uh, fossil fuel energy we try to increase the mix of renewables into the grid. And over time, we increase renewables, decrease fossil fuel consumption and production. Uh, but if we must exploit our fossil fuels, we use, we use the cleanest technologies possible so that the, the footprint is gradually reduced to a point over time where we achieve as close to 100% or whatever the ratio will be of renewables as possible to gradually decarbonize our economy. Uh, we also have this, these Paris Agreement commitments. So we have, in the fairly short term, we have some targets that we have to achieve. And these are incentives to push us, push us in that direction. And we're trying to achieve that through regulation and other means, including putting a price on carbon. So in our view, we're confident with our models and. Uh, all the uh, smart people who look at this, that we will achieve our Paris Agreement targets and that we gradually will have an orderly process for removing fossil fuels from the energy we use over a long time. Um, it's not going to be linear. It's not going to be easy. Uh, there's a lot of pushback in Canada from provinces who now believe we've had provincial elections and some of these governments don't believe in uh, carbon tax or dealing aggressively with climate change. The federal government is absolutely intent on doing it. And uh, we will assert uh, jurisdiction constitutionally and we'll go to court if necessary. But uh, this will happen. Um, but again, these are complex issues that play out over a long time. And uh, you might have zigzagging along the way. That's the sort of the balancing act of exploiting resources ever more cleanly um, and protecting the environment ever more effectively and hoping that, in fact, we, we do our part appropriately to sustain the standard of living on one hand, but protect the environment on the other. And it's much more easier said than done, but that's what the government's trying to do. I hope that helps. Of course, we encourage our American friends to, to join us. Yeah, shortly after the agreement was hammered out, I read an analysis, and I think it was Washington Post, talking about the fact that the agreements were not all that different from the NAFTA predecessor. And I'll leave out the Mexico part, but in the Canada-U.S. part, they said the biggest sticking points had been, as you mentioned, softwood lumber, dairy products, and the cross-border manufacturing of automobiles and automobile-related parts and services. Um, from your perspective, do you see that there were any other major significant shifts from the predecessor agreement, or was this just a way for Trump to get U.S. in the first name of the agreement? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, we went into this negotiation hoping for more. 
we wanted more integration of our industries, more ability to move professionals across borders so that our companies could have the right people in the right place because many of our companies straddle the, at least one border, if not two. Um, and then you get into immigration debates in America and that becomes complicated, but we had objectives for more opportunities for indigenous people, more opportunities for women in trade and the economy, um, and uh, a few other things. Uh, I would tell you that from our perspective, what we have achieved is we have protected the gains of NAFTA um, in a situation where the American government, in our view, was trying to walk back from the gains achieved under NAFTA, create more um, managed trade, not free trade, um, systems of quotas and tariffs and so on. So, at the very least, we have preserved the essential parts of the existing NAFTA, where those were being aggressively undermined, in our view, by American proposals. Now, having done that, we have achieved a few things. And you mentioned modernization of rules of origin for automaking. That is, that is uh, correct. We did give in a bit more market access to our uh, dairy market to American producers, 3.6%. Uh, I would tell you that we had given in that kind of concession mostly under the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. You might have remembered uh, one of the very first things your president did is take the U.S. out of the TPP. Under TPP, uh, I believe we had already granted uh, American uh, producers 3.2% of our dairy market. So by walking away, you get nothing, and now we, you have to renegotiate it back. And in fact, there is an incremental additional access to our market. So we, we, did, we did compromise on that, um, but at the same time, we preserved essential aspects of the existing NAFTA for us. And altogether, if you look at the enormity of this agreement, it's 1,500 pages, whatever, everywhere throughout, there are modernized provisions which should make the business of our companies doing business together more seamless and uh, reduce costs and so on. So we did modernize uh, the agreement to fit a modern economy. Um, apart from that, we, there were things very important to us, they were achieved. Um, so I think that gives you a sense that we wanted to go further. We couldn't, we wanted to, but um, um, American negotiators and perhaps Mexican did not necessarily agree with us, but we have a compromise that is a good basis to go forward. I hope that's helpful. Next question. Mr. Speaker, surely having trade with Canada and Mexico and the United States must be a real burden not to have the same measurement system. Has this been negotiated in these talks? And did you have any success persuading this country to catch up with the rest of the world? That's a good question. Um, I think we gave up on that one and didn't even try. I don't know if it's America alone on the, on the uh, imperial system or America and Vanuatu or some island in the Pacific, I don't think. But, um, I don't think we had high hopes of converting America to the metric system. Uh, in full disclosure, I'm a citizen of both countries. Lived over four, <laughs> you bet. I've lived over 40 years here, did my business in both countries. And one of the observations I think that Canada has always played with the US and Europe is kind of a bridge, cultural bridge, uh, across the Atlantic. It, could you make a comment about, is that still as prevalent? And uh, how do they enact that now? That's a profound question because I know in my career, I've often been in positions, uh, I used to work for the Canadian Space Agency, uh, for example, and I would go to Europe, meetings in Europe and people would ask us to explain America to, to them. Um, I'm glad I don't have that to do that anymore. Uh, but 
Um, and then, um, so I think I think Canada's ability because we are North American, but we are culturally very in particular on the French side, but I would say it's true across the country. We're very open to other countries, and, and historically, of course, we have deep links to uh, England and France. So I think that it puts us in a particularly good position to be uh, an interlocutor on difficult issues. But Canada generally, in our foreign policy over decades, has tried to play that honest broker role, uh, where you would have, in the Cold War, it would be uh, America and the Western world against the other side, and um, we would often try, or with uh, with uh, the developed world and the developing world, Canada would often try to be an honest broker and bring people to a table and try to hash out a compromise. I think we are well suited for that because we are by necessity open to trading with the world and and uh, culturally very connected to um, our heritage in Europe. Um, and we're not, I would say, we're not as powerful as you are. Um, we're not as insular as you are. Um, and that maybe gives us an ability to have conversations that uh, maybe for Americans are not necessary or always welcome. That's... Um, a complicated question, but uh, you, you see, America is extraordinarily powerful and rich, protected by geography, the same way we are, but you have such an internal market that you can sell to each other, and uh, you are, of course, open to the world because you're active everywhere in the world, but the position of Canada is very different. We are not a military power, we're not a... Uh, dominant economic power. And so our power comes not from hard power, but from soft power, which means ideas, means relationships, it means the willingness to engage and uh, often to set the table where people can come and, and uh, have, have conversations. Um, it comes from making suggestions for a more just world, um, uh, you know, um, in, in respect to peace and security around the world. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to Lester B. Pearson, the former prime minister, if you may remember, for his role in creating the Blue Helmets and the peacekeepers in the UN. Canada was a major force with America in setting up the UN after the war. The war. Um, so uh, we have by necessity a need to engage. Our prosperity depends on it. And maybe in America, your need to do that uh, in a way that is very open is slightly different because of your power and your, and your, your history. Thank you. I wonder if Canada has any advice for the United States regarding universal health care. Oh. <laughs> sure, but do you want to listen? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, this is this is uh, one of the perhaps differences between Canada and the U.S. When you look at a, 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 an issue like healthcare, um, you and the way different societies set up their healthcare system, it can be a window in how that society, what are its values, what does it value primarily, and. I think I'll, I'll make a generalization. It's grossly incomplete, and forgive me for that. But in Canada, we have we put a lot of value in solidarity between the citizens. Um, we accept higher taxes, for example, and we pay more tax. But we accept that through the tax system, we will get benefits. And we want those benefits to be, by and large, in particular on healthcare, available to everyone, regardless of need. Are there trade-offs with that? Yes, of course. Um, maybe my access to healthcare in Montreal may not be as quick as yours if you have insurance. Maybe I'll wait a little bit longer. Maybe my hotel room won't be as nifty as if I had top-of-the-line insurance. But as I do that, 
I can I can rest at night knowing that folks who have less means than I will have the same privilege. That's a societal choice that Canadian society made. It wasn't always like that. It started in Saskatchewan and it became uh, it became a staple of who we are. And we define ourselves largely by issues like that. And uh, but we made that choice. We're always trying to improve the system, but universality, portability, there are principles in the Canada Health Act, which is that federal law that governs how healthcare will be produced. Healthcare is a responsibility of the provinces in Canada. The healthcare services will be provided by the provinces or regulated by them. But the federal government sets the basic framework applicable nationwide. Universality is one of those uh, principles. Now, we don't cover everything. You know about Canada, the dental care is not covered. Uh, um, you know, uh, there are things that are not covered by the basic services available to all Canadians. But anything that is required for your basic health is covered. And uh, that includes primary care physicians and hospital stays. And we'd like medication to be covered. It's not yet, but every election we get promises. So. That's a work in progress, but in Canada, that's the way we want it to be because we believe we should be uh, supporting each other in this. Um, it's an ongoing debate in your country. We'll see how that turns out. It's certainly very dramatic. But um, there are, there's no, no perfect system. It's, you know, um, our, our out health outcomes, meaning meaning uh, the health of our people and li li life longevity and all that, is very comparable to yours, and in fact better in some areas and less good in some areas, but overall very comparable to any system in the world. Um, but there are trade-offs. We would like it to be sometimes more accessible. Uh, there's a shortage of primary care physicians in Canada in many parts, so we, we have to improve it, but we will not compromise on universality. Um, I heard a portion of a program recently uh, during our <coughs> process of confirming our last Supreme Court justice that uh, was implying, or, or the, point, the point of the program was that Canadians do it differently uh, without putting so much politics into it. Could you tell us what that system is for uh, Supreme Court justice? At the moment? Sure. Sure. Um, the first thing is our Supreme Court judges or judges for lower courts do not need to be confirmed by an arm of the legislature. So in the case, your, in your case, it's the Senate uh, for federal judges. We don't have that system. So by and large, um, federal judges are appointed by the prime minister and his cabinet, what we call the governor and council. So the prime minister and his cabinet will decide to appoint judges, including to the Supreme Court, on the recommendation of a, the Canadian Bar Association. And um, there may be other consultations and inputs into the process, but uh, essentially it's professional associations providing names, and the government will review the names for qualifications, and the government will make an appointment, and that's the end of it. So not, as, not nearly as... Uh, Politicized for sure. Just a follow up question to Debs on healthcare. I think the US uh, now pays about 16% of our GDP is, is spent on healthcare. Do you have any idea what it is in Canada? Far lower, but I don't have the exact number. But you are the outlier of the whole planet in terms of. Uh, <laughs> sorry, but. <laughs> In terms of the costs, uh, the GDP ratio far, far higher. The, I, I remember the bar chart. The, high, the highest bar is America, and everybody else starts at the middle portion. And so I don't know quite the number for Canada, but uh, there is a great resource if ever you're interested. It's called the Commonwealth Fund, Commonwealth Fund, and they they have all the metrics about things like that. You can Google them and find those numbers. Uh, Canada is sort of middle of the pack. Um, uh, it's very expensive in Canada to provide universal uh, service, healthcare. Um, 
in Quebec and Ontario, I know that over half of the provincial budget is healthcare. So the health minister controls half of the, of the entire government's expenditures. So uh, it's, it's not an easy thing, and it's certainly not cheap. Uh, but but in a, but we, we, the, the thing I think to I'm not an expert. I used to work in this area, but I'm not a real expert in healthcare. But if you have a single payer system, you can look for efficiencies in the system. Um, a single purchaser of equipment or provider of medication or whatever can look for economies of scale, which is not true if you have a distributed. Um, envelopes of money funding different distributed services. So that's an oversimplification. Um, but um, yeah, I think the Commonwealth Fund would be a good resource for you on this. Um, I have a question, um, and it deals with gun control. Uh, I am, uh, full disclosure, former correspondent based in Toronto, covered Canada for four years from. Detroit, for which American newspaper, and I noticed in the Star or the Globe and Mail, whatever, that they were scandalized. Now this is the mid '80s. That uh, Toronto metro area, which then was about three million, had 52 murders that year by guns. Detroit, <laughs> say no more. Uh, which had a population of less than 100,000 at that point. Uh, so it was like one murder a week, right, in Toronto. Uh, with Detroit, it was 600 and something, like two murders a day. Uh, there's a real difference going on, and you have a very different approach with gun control, and I'd like you to talk about it. Whoa. <laughs> All the easy questions, huh? Healthcare, gun control. <laughs> um, I, I would just say we don't understand Americans' love affair with guns. Like, we don't. There's nothing. I've, I've read about it, I've talked to people. Um, I could speculate, but I'm, I'm just an observer. Uh, but in Canada, uh, we don't have the same history as you do. We don't have the same protected rights under the Constitution as you do. And uh, in Canada, there's not a sense that um, this is such a fundamental right to us. The way it's not protected the same way as your, your amendment, uh, Second Amendment uh, rights. So culturally and legally and otherwise, it, it, it cannot, it doesn't compute for us. Now, we have our hunters and our rural people, but often in the cities too, and they, they insist on the ability to go hunting, and that's important for many people, and I get it. And uh, yes, there will be certain weapons that they can buy with a permit and necessary background checks, and that's okay. But this notion that a wide variety of firearms, in particular, semi-automatic, whatever, that would be somehow very important to own. Uh, for us, it doesn't compute, it just doesn't. I don't know how to be more eloquent than that. Uh, the government right now actually is looking at, uh, there has been a spike in Toronto in uh, firearm deaths in the last year or two. The government's looking at uh, consulting, in fact, on a nationwide uh, handgun ban, a possible, possible handgun ban that the police would have their weapons, but anybody else uh, may not need, unless you have a particular need for it. I guess there will be exceptions. So it's not, it's not difficult, it's sensitive topic, but the government can open consultations like that, and we don't have riots in the streets. Because, in, again, we, we accept there will be reasonable limits to the ability of our citizens to carry firearms, and if you need to go hunting, great, but you don't need a, an AK-47 or whatever it is to do that. Uh, and if you don't need it, you don't get it. Um, but there are people who feel strongly about the other way, uh, much closer to some of the uh, American positions on that. Uh, but the majority of our people uh, 
um, absolutely agree to strict controls for public security. Uh, a lot of uh, suicides take place uh, using firearms, and mistakes happen, and uh, we don't want accidental deaths, and we don't want people in the streets with guns everywhere. That's a societal choice. Again. Well, thank you very much, Consul General Lassar.